a good thing. Just like you want to split up your money in a stock portfolio, same thing with real estate. Because different areas of the country have different markets. So I know people, a lot of people deal with it. I'm only buying in California. But what happens if we're at the top of the market here? Right? You're not going to see any appreciation. And you're going to be stuck with 3% cash flow in your building. <laughs> Fun. Exactly. So, you know, and again, it's a bet. You know, I can't tell you the market's not going to go up anymore here. It, it, you know, i just saying that when you look at the data, it's kind of unlikely, but, <laughs> but you know, there's going to be situations where it does go up some more. So, again, by diversifying your, your portfolio, you're hedging your bet. Question? Yep. Question? Oh. On the 45-day period for identification, do you find people identifying more than one property because... Oh yeah, all the time. I mean, things happen, you know. Yeah, I, I'm going to tell you a terrible story. There was a guy that I was trying to deal with, and this was just a, earlier this year, and he was doing a very large exchange, and he identified a bunch of properties. Unfortunately, he didn't nail down the uh, contracts on them before he, before the 45-day period. A bunch of his properties fell out of escrow. You know, he didn't even get them in escrow. So those properties. Um, they fell out. He ended up getting a you know a multi-million dollar uh, well, failed exchange. Tax, tax it, right? Yeah. So even though you identify, the point I'm making here is it's not just a matter of identifying the property. You got to have that property tied up under contract, right. because again, it's happened. And look, we've all been through this. You go to buy a property, you do your deals, you go, oh my God, I had no idea when I had my phase one study done that there's an old tank under there that's filled with who knows what, <laughs> right? And you don't know that until you do your, your due diligence. So you want to, you know, things fall out of escrow. So you've got to really be prepared for all this stuff ahead of time. Yeah? If you have a property that's, say, 27 years you've had, and you're getting close to the end of your 26 depreciation, yeah. when you exchange, does that factor go into a portion of what you exchange into? It does. Your, your basis carries forward from the property you're selling to the property you're purchasing, which is why most people buy a bigger property because now you get a higher basis. Like if you go from a $1 million property that had a basis of 100,000 into a $2 million property, your basis went from 100,000 up to 1.1 million. So now you've got more depreciation. Everyone following me on that? So whatever, you, whatever the increase in the value of the property, you know, from the one you're selling to the one you're buying, that's gonna raise your basis. And these are all tax stuff that you can really dig in with your CPA. But the point is that, that, you know, there's advantages to doing this. I'm going to show you a building we were involved in Hollywood. This was two years ago now. It sold at a 3% cap rate, which was normal for LA. <laughs> and we took that money and bought three other properties. They were actually all out of state and different types of properties too, right? Because we talked about a triple net lease property, another apartment, and a medical building. <coughs> and these were all in the 6 to 7% cap range, which meant that these guys were originally making and then this was being actually very liberal, saying you're making $90,000 um, into a situation where they're making a good, stable $180,000 of income. So they, they more than doubled their cash flow. I love that math. It's very good <laughs> math. <laughs> All right, so the other example, we had a client that sold a duplex in LA. They went into a bunch of smaller properties. These had much higher cap rates. He actually tripled his income. Went from $12,000 to 37,000 of net income, that's after expenses, okay? Um, so again, when we're talking about cap rates, which is what, how we always think of it, and in different parts of the country, this is a great <coughs> illustration of how this works. So we took Starbucks, these were actually sales from about two years ago. This was a Starbucks in Costa Mesa. It sold at a three and three quarter percent cap rate. Same kind of building, same lease with Starbucks, only this time it's in Kansas, sold at a 5% cap rate. Same thing, only this time we're in Jacksonville, Florida, 5.5%, and in Indianapolis, a whopping 6.5% cap rate. So we can all argue about why that happens, but you're just gonna find that certain markets have certain cap rates, which means your cash flows are gonna be a lot different in those markets. For whatever reason, out of the top 15 uh, markets in the United States, Indianapolis was right near the bottom of that, but they always come out as the highest cap rates. You're always gonna get your best cash flows in any major market in Indianapolis, which is one reason why we deal a lot in Indianapolis. So let's talk about that for a minute. And again, I'm not gonna get too deep into this, but one reason why we like some of these other cities we deal in, Indianapolis is a good example, is when we had the recession, we had a big drop in uh, property values in, in you know, California, a lot of the markets here, 
when you go to some of these other Midwest markets, you'll see a softening, but not a crash. You know, it depends on the city, obviously, but, but Indianapolis, which happens to be the, the state capital, and there's a lot of stuff going on there, um, it's just a very stable market. Now, you're not going to see your money double in five years. It's not going to skyrocket, but it's not going to crash either. So again, if you're thinking in terms of, okay, you know, do I take some of my money from California and put it somewhere else in a stable market, you know, this is a great market to be in. Um, and again, they've got a lot of universities. Uh, Lily, Eli Lilly's there. Salesforce is there. Rolls Royce, where they make the big uh, airplane engines, is there. So it's just a good, stable market. Um, so what we're doing there is we work with a, a group there, actually the main guy, Michael Drew. And so what he does is he buys these small single family homes and they probably average about $80,000. <laughs> and uh, you can buy one with a tenant in it and they're going to cash flow around 9%. That's probably the average. Much higher than you see anywhere else. And so again, he's buying these houses, he fixes them up, puts a tenant in there, he's got a management company. Just a nice little turnkey operation we got with them. And actually, we need to update this. We've done over 150 houses in that market. And most of the houses we did, probably 80% of them were right in this area right here. So it's within the main part of Indianapolis, and the rest of them were over here by the speedway. Um, just a good, stable market, nothing fancy. Um, here's uh, some investors that flew up to look at them. Uh, but they're just kind of, you know, plain Jane kind of homes. Uh, just to show you how the numbers work, give you an idea. Here's one we sold earlier this year. It was about, what, 1,100 square feet. Um, nice little lot. Again, nothing exciting. <laughs> Rent was $900 a month. I take out the management, the taxes, the insurance, everything else. You're, you're left with uh, between a 9 and a 10% cash, cash flow. Or cap rate, however you want to look at it. So you compare this to buying a, an apartment building, you're going to find that apartments around the country have all been bid up. <laughs> And there's a lot of people trying to buy apartment buildings. And again, it's, it's because of what I was saying earlier. With interest rates being so low, a lot of pension funds, a lot of insurance companies, everybody's out there buying apartment buildings. And I'm seeing it all over the country. And they're bidding them up a lot. Yes? So, so <coughs> one of the problems with having a single family is that if you have a vacancy, then you're covering all the costs. But if you have multiple units, then you're, at least you have some cash flow. What do right. you think about so, that? So how much? You know, if you were to buy an apartment building right now in California, how much would you pay per unit? At least a hundred thousand. In LA, it's probably one hundred and fifty yeah. or more, right? Mm -hmm. So this is eighty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Buy ten of them. That's mm -hmm. actually cheaper than buying a ten unit in LA. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So if you got one vacancy, and truthfully, the vacancies here, you know, the only thing, the only downside we've had with these is that the um, rental market there is seasonal. So if you lose a tenant in December, you're going to wait for two, three, four months before you get a new tenant. Nobody wants to move in winter. And also, we generally do three bedroom, one bath, and um, it's because you get a family. We want a family in there. Families will last four or five years as a tenant. They don't like moving. The kids are in school, all that kind of stuff. And so, but they don't like moving in the middle of the school year. So we always time our leases. They come up, you know, this late spring or summer. And it's really easy to get tenants, never had a problem. So every market's going to have its pros and cons. Um, and you're, you're going to get a vacancy once in a while. It's going to happen. You know, you're, you're a landlord. And tenants have good things happen. Yeah. Would you say the con in an area like that, it's just not great appreciation over 10, 20, 30 years? Correct. The appreciation there has been 3 to 5% a year. So again, this is nothing exciting. It's just slow, steady growth. But believe me, when there's a downturn in the economy, you're going to do better here than you are in other markets. You know, you're buying something that's paying nine or ten percent cash flow. Okay, so you have to drop your rents. Now you're five or six percent cash flow. A lot better than you get in markets here. And you and you had to lower your rent. <laughs> so, and then you know that eventually we're going to get through the recession, come out the other end, and things will go back up again. And again, everything you know, there's pros and cons to everything. I'm not saying this is perfect, but it's something we use. Um, and you can see they go in, fix them up nice. Um, now, we don't just do single family homes there. Uh, we, do, we like, okay, so whenever you're doing something out of state, what's the biggest problem? Management. management. And the biggest problem of any property, anywhere actually, is management. <laughs> so we always want to do something that's, you know, recently renovated, so it's in great shape. And we want to do something that's maybe even brand new. 
Um, or we want to do triple net lease. Because triple net lease properties, you don't have to worry. If you have a great tenant, so in this case, we just sold this one a few months ago. It was in the, in the uh, Indianapolis market. Um, it went for, was it 1.4 million, right around there? It was about a 6% six cap, 6 cap rate, but it had a brand new 20 year triple net lease. And it was with um, a franchisee of Pizza Hut. They owned over 200 Pizza Huts, and so they were a really good tenant. And then, look, I've been through, well, put it this way. There's something I can absolutely guarantee you guys. We're gonna have a recession. Guaranteed. I can't tell you when, I can't tell you how bad, but I know it's gonna happen, right? Yeah. I've been to, through two bad recessions in my lifetime, my, and they were very painful. I literally lost millions of dollars. <laughs> I don't want that to happen again. <laughs> I go into something like this, okay, I'm not gonna make a huge amount of money in this property, but guess what? It's gonna be a good, stable property. The next downturn in the economy, do people still buy pizzas? No. Exactly, <laughs> it's not gonna go away. So, you know, again, you know, it's not something you're gonna double your money, but we're looking at preservation of capital and something that you just feel comfortable being in. You don't have to worry uh, when you have a triple net lease, I'm not sure how much you guys know about that, but triple net lease means that the tenant pays for the property taxes, the insurance, and the maintenance, okay? So if this driveway has to be redone, who's gonna pay for it? The tenant. <coughs> if the air conditioning goes out, if, if the you know, if electrical panel blows out, whatever it is, the tenant has to pay for all that. And that's how most commercial type properties like this are done. So again, this is a great property to put someone in who just doesn't want headaches and just wants good cash flow and then some stability. So again, this is not for everybody, but if you're thinking of building a portfolio, it definitely should be something that you're thinking about. Um, How much does a building like that cost? You know, uh, this type of asset is going to be between one and two million. Actually, this one is three million. The picture looks the same. There was two properties. Oh, this oh, that was two properties together, actually. Yeah, you're right. Um, yeah. <laughs> So management is always a big issue. Do you ever do your single family homes with uh, leased home? Um, I actually have personally. <laughs> personally, okay. Yeah, I actually have a bunch of those. Good. But, um, but you know, we can't do those. Yeah. Um, all right, sorry, sorry, skip here. So there's another building we did earlier this year. It was a big industrial building, um, four and a half million dollars. And it was an 8.8% .8 cap rate, triple net lease. Uh, great tenant. See all these uh, trucks here? <coughs> Those are ambulances. This is the second largest manufacturer of ambulances in America. So we went out there and we were interviewing the, uh, the owner of the company. I go, you know, how'd you guys do in the last recession? He goes, nothing happened. They sold just as many ambulances in the recession as they did before and after. <laughs> so that's the kind of tenant you want to be in when you're with, you know, for a long-term scenario, because again, we're gonna have a recession someday, so I wanna have my money somewhere where I don't believe that. Um, okay, so the other market, I'm going a little bit fast here because I usually do this in a little bit longer seminar. The other state we'd like a lot is Texas. Texas is the number one growing state in America, by far. Um, again, when, the, when, the, when property, I'm oh, sorry. those stats currently? As far as I know. Okay. I mean, I, I, been, I go to Dallas, you know, two, three times a year, and man, oh man, it's insane yeah. with Houston. It's just crazy what's going on there. Yeah, you know, Dennis Hansen loves Dallas, so that's why I was asking. Sure, who? Dennis Hansen. Oh, okay. Don't know, but yeah, but it's a great market. Um, okay, so again, similar chart. When we had the recession, things dipped in Dallas, but they didn't crash. Now, truthfully, Dallas right now is a little tough. It's gotten really overheated there, um, but there is still some stuff we're doing. Um, but a big reason is thanks to California. You know, it's mainly California companies that are going to Texas right now. Um, this city right here, Frisco, um, I was dealing with a developer there, and he told me the only city in the world that had more development going on right now than Frisco was Dubai. <laughs> yeah. Now, I didn't verify that. I took his word for it. But anyway, if you go there, you'll see there's a lot of stuff going on. And these are all companies that have been moving there. Um, you can see the job growth in Houston and Dallas is, is huge. Number one. And just, I took these pictures about not even two years ago. This is a brand new building in Plano, Texas, which is just where I showed you that map. Uh, this is uh, FedEx's global headquarters. 1,200 employees just moved in there. Uh, right across the street from it, literally, Liberty Mutual, and that's, that's finished now. 
Uh, 6,000 employees moved into that complex. All those cranes there, that's one giant complex. <laughs> Just for Liberty Mutual Insurance wow. Company. And right next to it, literally they share the same property line, was Toyota. And 4,000 employees moved into there. That was one intersection. <laughs> so, I mean, there's just a lot of stuff going on there. Um, anyway, one reason why, um, this is a company we've dealt with, Megatel, they're the, one of the largest home builders in, in Dallas, Fort Worth. You can buy brand spanking new, state of the art, 3,500 square foot home for about $500,000. <laughs> in a nice area. Yeah, these are good areas. Um, now, one thing that, and we were doing these earlier, but I think that we, we kind of shift screen a little bit. What we're doing now is we have a builder we work with and they're building brand new townhomes and they're building them all in the north area where all the growth is. So you can buy about an 1,800 square foot townhome for around $260,000. Um, we actually have an agreement with them that they won't close escrow until you get a tenant, which is real easy there. And it's going to be about a 6% cash flow. And we have a very good management company. They're a good friend of ours, um, has an excellent big management company. You can do all around you know, Dallas Fort Worth. So if you're interested in that, um, we have these come up periodically as he builds them and we can, you know, <coughs> buy them. Um, but anyway, that's just kind of the market there. Um, we also did, uh, this we did late last year. We had clients sell an apartment building in Glendale. He was an older guy. He wanted something with headache free. Uh, this property came up. It was totally off market. We knew the developer. Brand new uh, building. Uh, Decra, you probably never heard of, but they're actually a huge multinational German company. And in Texas, you have to get your uh, car um, safety checked every year for the DMV. And so this is, this is like a jiffy loop. You drive in, they lift your car up, you know, they look under it and everything. And so this was a 15 year triple net lease, brand spanking new. We were, we, in fact, our client closed escrow day one of that lease because they just moved in. And that was paying 6.2% cash flow, cap rate, and he had sold his building for 2.4 million and the, the numbers worked out really good in this case. Um, and now, if anything ever happened to Decra 15 years from now, I'm not worried at all, because that's going to be some other car related. You know, someone's going to go in there and have a good car. It's going to be very easy to get a new tenant for a seller. <clears throat> One other thing you should know, you know, we try to do 15 or 20 year leases, because if you sell a property and it's got 10 years left in the lease, it's really easy to sell. When you get less than 10 years, it gets tougher and tougher. So if you bought a property that had 15 or 20 year lease on it, and, and again, we're dealing with a lot of people that are going, you know what, if I cash out some of my property in LA, go to some of these other markets, <coughs> down the road, we have another dip in the economy, I'll come back and buy some property in LA when the prices are more reasonable. Um, this is a great strategy, because again, you go park your money for five years, you can easily sell this building, you know, with 10 years left of the lease, and then come back and buy something here in this market, if, you know, if that's your strategy. Everybody has their own you know, long-term strategy. Okay, so another building we did. Um, okay, so let's talk about Houston. Another market we've done a lot in. We like it a lot. Um, but here we're doing something a little different. We're doing these manufactured homes. And so we have an arrangement with a group. They actually are one of the largest owners of manufactured home parks all around the Houston market. They have over 35 of them. And so this is a park, a park that we did with them. We've actually sold it all out, but their model is they buy the land, put in the streets, put in all the, you know, they'll buy the manufactured homes and put them in place, rent them all out, and they manage it, and then they sell off the individual manufactured homes through us, and so as an investor, you buy one of these homes. And this is uh, that same park I was showing you. It's actually very nice. A uh, gated community. This building here is where the management lived and worked. Um, but you can see it's all real clean. This, this particular one was only a couple years old, so everything was pretty new. So these homes went for about fifty-three thousand dollars each. If you're buying as an investor, wow. yeah. Okay. So, and what, so what you price? just said is they put renters into all of them, and then they start selling them to investors. Correct. Okay. Yep. You got it. And what's and so, the rent on those for us? Sorry. The rent on those? What? It's, it's, well, this park was what eleven hundred or thousand? This is a thousand. Thousand. Yeah. Thousand wow. dollars. Yeah. Wow. And these things rent like that. <laughs> We're doing a project right now in Beaumont, which is about two hours east of uh, Houston. And before they even finished installing the new unit, they got a tenant. Wow. Yeah, the Do market there is... Depreciate them like a home? Pardon me? Treat depreciate. Yes. And that's a good point. So, um, in Texas, 
when you register the, the manufactured home, you actually check off a box whether you want to treat it as real estate or personal property. Okay? So if you check it off as real estate, this qualifies for a 1031 exchange, and you get to depreciate it just like you would any property, you know, the 27 and a half years. So, um, yeah. Um, now, in California, you can't do that. And, you know, and I'll tell you the difference. In Texas, when we're doing these, you're not buying the land. You're just buying the building, right? There's a, there's a lease for the land. In California, you have to buy the land and the building together to make it qualify for real estate. But you don't have to do that in Texas. Any question? Why would somebody register this personal property? What's I mean, if you didn't care, I mean, if you're just buying it for yourself, who cares? Whether it's, you know, you're not depreciating it, you know. And actually, just so you know, a little trick. If you really want to get fast depreciation as personal property, it's an eight-year depreciation schedule. Oh, wow. Now it costs segregated even more. Quicker. Yeah, exactly. So if you want, but, but the problem with that is you box yourself in and you can't do a 1031 later. So that, you know, so I always tell people we should do it as real estate and we don't have to worry about it later. So, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a great little program we've got. We've done tons of these. I think we've sold about 200 of them now. Um, and, and like I said, they're a lot nicer than what most people realize. Um, here's numbers just, and then just so you guys know, if you want this uh, slideshow, just um, we give you a thing to fill out and you can give us your email. We can email us to you. Um, a lot of people like to keep that and you get these numbers. But anyway, these particular ones were $53,500, $1,000 a month rent. Now when the, the tenant writes their checks, they're writing one check to the, um, for the lot lease, right, for the land. And then they're writing a second check to use the investor, which is going to go through the management company. So the total of the two checks was $1,000. 325 was the check written for the, the lot. And after you peel at all the expenses, you're getting about 11.5% cash flow. Now you're not buying these for appreciation, right? We're not betting on these going up in value. But we're getting great cash flow. <laughs> and there's two other things about this we like a lot. One is you're paying $38 a month out of that, and it's up to you, but most people do it, and that covers any maintenance, right? So if the air conditioning goes out, or if a tenant moves out and you have to get a new one in and, and you know, clean the carpets, all that kind of stuff, that $38 a month covers all those expenses. Wow. What about flood insurance? Oh, um, well, that's a really good point. <laughs> so as we know, in Houston, a year and a half ago, they had the worst storm they've had in over 100 years. <coughs> Right? <coughs> Nothing happened with all these parks. They have, like I said, this group has over 35 parks, and they're all fine. And they're not in flood zones or whatever. And also, by law, they have to be mounted three feet off the ground on, on, the, you know, on the foundation. So um, we've not had any issues with that. But, and just so you know how the insurance works, the insurance covers, or sorry, there's an there's a insurance policy for the whole park. And so you're, you're under that umbrella policy. So you are paying your you know, fee, it's a couple hundred dollars, a year, oh yeah, three hundred sixty dollars a year, depending on the park, but but that's your portion of it. Yeah. If somebody wanted to invest in the park rather than the individual properties, is that an option? We're not offering that right now, and I'll tell you why. Just like multifamily, all these big guys are have figured this out, and so you're going to find that a lot of these parks around the country, if it's in a good area, there's a bit of a bidding war going on. Right now, buying. And just so you guys know, buying multifamily or the, the manufactured home parks, if it's in a half decent market, you know, good city or whatever, you're probably looking at a five to six percent cap rate, which for California seems really good, but traditionally that's really low for those markets. So there's a lot of money going. Like I said, just picture all this money coming into America looking for a home, and they're looking for something that pays some kind of cash flow, and so the parks and stuff. You know, they're being bid up. And there's there's large REITs right now that are out buying manufactured home parks. Um, yeah. Do you have any experience or information about REITs that you might want to talk to us about? I mean, that's another whole subject. Yeah, but but, but, but are you involved where you could come back and actually do that? Yeah. Yeah, we can talk about that, yeah. Okay, right. um, Rusty? But, Yep. Is that is that slide really true then? Because what, <laughs> yeah. I, what I just heard was five and six cap rate versus. Well, again, five, that's if you buy the whole park. Well, if you buy the whole park, it's a six percent cap rate. It's going to be in that range, yeah. Got it. And, and again, it's because a lot of people want to buy the parks. We're one of the only people I know of that are selling off the individual buildings like this. 
And it's just sort of an unusual arrangement we made with these guys, and it's working out great because they're going to, because their money's tied up in all those homes. They sell them off, but they want to keep the the park, right? And then the money they collect from you know investors buying those homes, they can go buy another park and right. they keep expanding that one. Do you do any notes on them as opposed to selling them? Um, we haven't, and that's another good point. These things you you have to pay all cash. We haven't gotten a good financing group to work with on it. Um, but one other good point I'm going to make is that the group we're working with here, they're going to guarantee after 24 months, if you want to sell your unit, they will buy it back for the same price that you bought it for. So you have a backstop. Now it's yours. You can sell it to whoever you want for whatever you want. But just so you know, you know, let's just say four years ago you want to get back out of it, they will buy the unit back from you at the same price. And the reason they're doing that is um, hardly anybody ever sells me because where are you going to replace that cash flow? But on top of that, um, rents have probably gone up and they can turn around and sell it to someone else, you know, probably for more. Yes? I have a little nitty gritty question about the individual units. What's the lifespan of an individual unit? Good question. I mean, the, the units that are being made now are very high quality. They've raised all the standards and everything on them. We're thinking they're going to last the same as a regular house, really. Not a whole lot different. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. I, I mean, amazing. when you see these trailer parks that are really beat up, and the yeah. hurricane hits it and wipes it out and stuff, yeah. those are ones that were built years and years ago, and they didn't have the same standards yeah. as today, yeah. and they weren't tied down the way they are tied down now. Like now, they have these pylons that go six feet into the ground, and they've got. In fact, I think we have a picture of it. Let me see. Um, oh yeah, here we go. See here, we took a picture without the screw on it. Each one of these as a concrete pylon that goes six feet in the ground all the way along, and then they put a strap over the building. You know, it's underneath the roof and everything. So they are solid, <laughs> you know, real solid. Um, yeah, and in fact, they had, you know, like I said, the 100 year storm there, and these were totally fine, nothing happened. They all went through it. Um, and, oh yeah, and then the other thing is we, we do a lot of these in IRAs. You know, if you have a retirement account, you can put your money in there in, to the IRA and then buy these units in there. And you're getting 11.5% better than most bonds. Yes? Um, is, the, uh, is it le less expensive, the Houston market versus Dallas? Do you get these opportunities and returns in the Dallas market as well as there's more Houston? Yeah, we're looking at some of these other markets. It just happened we tapped into this one group and they're huge. They have like, you know, 35 parks. And so we made that arrangement. We are looking for other markets. Are you doing too. Austin as well? In fact, we awesome. we're negotiating right now for a place in Austin. So we'll see. Austin, just you know, has gotten bid way up. Um, in fact, we had a property. We put an offer in last November. We put the offer in. It was a little shopping center. A client wanted to buy it, and literally the next day they announced that Apple was going to build a new facility there. What do you think happened to our offer? Adios. Exactly. Adios. <laughs> Said forget it. So Austin, and Austin's a much different market. It, it's very, um, Austin is like California. It's very restrictive getting permits and stuff there. And so um, that market has been heavily bid up and it's, it's next to impossible, in my opinion, to find a good property there right now. Um, but Houston, we do stuff. Okay, so now another, um, we do, we did actually some multifamily in Houston. Um, Actually, we kind of lucked out. Eddie found this property. It was a 20-unit building. Uh, we got it at over an 8% cap rate. Now, it needed work. Um, it's going to need, uh, well, this one we bought for, what, $1.55 million. Probably needed $300,000 of work on it, but still, it was, a, it was a good one. Since then, we've been trying to find another one, and we haven't. <laughs> These same buildings right now are going for, like, a 6 cap, probably. And that's for an older building. For the newer, you know, a really nice, because... We did put an offer on a property that was right near downtown Houston, which was a really nice, very nice building that they very, you know, all renovated the whole bit, and it's going at a just over a five cap. So um, multifamily, like I said, it's really hard to find something like this. But we have to do. But, but what happened here, though, is kind of interesting. Is he had a twenty-unit building in Koreatown. He sold it. His net income was fifty thousand dollars off that building he sold, and then he went into uh, that twenty-unit I just showed you in Houston. Plus, he bought a whole bunch, he bought how many? He bought 15 of the uh, single family, you know, the multi uh, manufactured homes. So he did a blended portfolio. So his income went from 50000 a year 
to $135,000 a year. Wow. And we just did this transaction like a few months ago. So the whole purpose was to jump his cash flow. He was an older guy, he said, look, I just want to have uh, good cash flow and not have to worry about it, so this worked out good for him. Uh, another example, well, you saw that pizza I had earlier. Uh, this was uh, two brothers we were working with. They sold a building in Alhambra. They got $2.2 million from that. Um, and again, I'm not expecting you to read this, but they sold their building. They went into it again. They bought the Pizza Hut, and then they bought a bunch of family properties. They blended it between Indianapolis homes and the uh, manufacturing homes in Texas. And their income it was 70000 There we go. It went from 75000 up to 152000 of net income. That's after all their expenses. Awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, so this works out really good. I think we have one more example here. We'll wind things down. This was a uh, penthouse condo downtown LA. Client was renting it out. They, they, uh, we sold it for him, a million dollars. He was getting, we figured, three and a half percent cap rate. Same story. In this case, he went from one condo, he was getting 42,000 a year. And he went into 17, and again, it was blended between the uh, indie homes and the manufactured homes. And he's getting right now $115,000 a year. I mean, now, you know, everybody has, you know, we're not here to tell you about fix and flip stuff. We're here to tell you about, you know, kind of a little more passive type of investment. But again, we're dealing with a lot of people actually that do fix and flips. And then they're taking some of that money and putting it into something over here, like we're talking about, that gives them good, stable cash flow and they don't have to worry about it, and then they still keep doing their fix and flips. So, you know, everybody's gonna have their own strategy. The, the, the wonderful thing about real estate is there's so many different ways of looking at it and dealing with it, right? And so, you, you know, you, you're gonna learn that there's many, many different niches out there that people have. Yes? What determines the cap rate for the area? That's a big debate. It all depends. It's just, that's what happens in that market. You know, everybody wants to own property in LA, so it bids them prices up and then what's happened in LA is prices have gone up like that and the rents have gone up but not nearly as much. You know what I mean? The, the, the value of the building has gone up faster than the value or the rent being collected and it's made the cap rates go down. And again, I think it's really a function of the interest rates being so low. Somebody's sitting there going, do I buy a bunch of bonds paying 2% or do I buy a building that's paying 3 or 4%? You know? And, and that's, I really think that's what's happening. Um, I mean, just to compare, this is a building we sold for some clients earlier this year. It was a six-unit apartment building in Pasadena. Uh, went for just under 1.2 million, but it was a 2.2% cap rate. <laughs> and that place needed a lot of work. Truthfully, the rents were under market, so um, the new buyer took it over and re renovated it. But they, they had to put about 400,000 into that to make it even more, right? But they, you know, the way they wanted it. Um, if anyone's interested, this is a listing we have right now. It's actually off market, but it's a, um, a building right down by Dodger Stadium that a client of ours has. It's got two apartments on the first floor, and on the second floor, it's all individual. Um, it's like a boarding house. So that's why you're seeing the much higher cap rate. And so if you're interested in it, and uh, Michael have the information on it, but it's about a 7.5% cap rate. But it's going to be a little more management intensive because it's individual, um, like a boarding house, like I said. And this is what, 1.2 million? 1.2. Yeah. And then another building we have, it's in the process of selling. This is Mar Vista, which is down in Venice, which is a super hot area right now. Yeah. Um, this is 10 units, and this is off market right now. Our clients seeing if they, uh, you know, if they get some offers on it rather than on the market. Um, and this is going to be what 2.4 million. 2.5. 2.5. All right, well, I'm going to kind of skip ahead here. Yeah, so... Go back to the CBS. <laughs> oh. Yeah, this is one that... Uh, uh, well, we talked about REITs. There's a REIT that I deal with, and they have a big portfolio of triple net list of these properties. So we can kind of pick from those. And in fact, what they'll do is they'll even give us a 20-year guarantee on the lease, if you're interested. So this one is a CBS they got um, in, in Texas, and it's $4 million and a 5.6% cap. Do the reach pay out monthly? Yes. Yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, so this, you know, we have different, look, we have everything. The manufactured homes are anywhere from $40,000 to $55,000, and then we also do bigger deals, and we do combinations of all of the above. <laughs> are you yeah. involved at all at Airbnb? 
we're not. I mean, we have a lot of clients. Whoever that do. buys that Dodger thing. Mm -hmm. like that's that's awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, again, you have to check the neighborhood and everything. Airbnb is, is a great idea for cash flow, but it's a lot more management intensive. So you have to find a, a management company that focuses on doing that kind of thing because you have a huge, obviously, turnover. And the other problem we're running into is a lot of cities now are starting to get really restrictive on Airbnb. And so um, I know LA, there's a lot of saber rattling about what's going to happen there. And, uh, so there's a lot of questions right now about what's going to happen with Airbnb in certain markets. So you got to be over it. You know, you don't want to buy a property counting on Airbnb being it for the next five years. Because two years from now, the laws could change and you might not be able to do it. That's, that's, that is a big risk right now. You know, but it's great while you're doing it. <laughs> Yeah. All right, I know we're getting down to the end. So anyway, I'm giving you a lot of information here, a lot of different stuff to look at. Um, you know, I think we gave you a sheet there to fill out if you're interested. Um, put your information on there. Um, we'll be on our mailing list. Um, also, when we have properties come up, we'll do an email blast to our, our clients and our investors. And, and, you know, sometimes we get some really, we've actually, you know, sometimes come across a property and we broker it do an email blast, we actually did one, we literally within two hours had it in our contract after our email blast. <laughs> it was a good deal. Yeah. So if you came back to one of our meetings and did uh, a little bit of speaking, probably at the Marriott, not here, you only have one speaker, you get two hours, could you conceivably do an hour of that on reads only and then spend the other hour doing whatever else you do? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, we can do that. Okay. Yeah, and, and the whole idea of REITs is you can invest in those through your IRA and other kinds of stuff. Yeah, yeah. But um, but again, you know, um, if you're interested, if you are going to, you know, look, you don't have to do a 1031. You can buy this stuff, you know, just as an investor as well. Um, but if you're interested, let us know. And those spreadsheets I was showing you, if you have a property you're planning and selling, uh, Eddie and Michael in my office are really good at doing these spreadsheets. You give us your income and expenses and the rent rolls and everything off your property, we can plug that in and then give you some options that you may be interested in and show you how the numbers are going to work. And like I said, we do include all the expenses and everything, so you're going to get real numbers <laughs> and, and give you a really good idea of what options you have when you're doing a 1031 because you really want to plan that out way ahead of time. Where's your office? We're actually in San Marino, which is on the bottom of Pasadena. Okay, so you're Southern California. It's yep. not going to be a big problem for getting back up here again. No, and, and truthfully, my, my stepson has a ranch up in Santa Inez, which is where I'm going from here, so <laughs> I'll, I'll be going my way up there. So come by through here a couple times a month anyway. So we can always work something out. All right? I, I, I spent two days this week planting his vineyard <laughs> in the 90-degree weather. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. It was hot. I'm, in, I'm impressed. These Mexican guys are whipping up in that, because, you know, you're on a hillside like this where we were doing it. In the, in the heat, and those guys are in shape, wow. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so anyway, thank you all very much. Hopefully I can hear from you guys soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely.